For generations, people have wondered about the Earth. What drives clouds high into the afternoon sky? Where does the wind come from? How could conditions on the very edge of space change a barren land into a lush forest? Join us as we explore the mysteries of the Earth's atmosphere. The weather patterns that drench equatorial forests with rain also cause oceans of sand in the great deserts. Patterns in the air, this time on the Miracle Planet. From space, the most prominent feature of Earth is not its great oceans or mountain ranges, but the atmosphere that gives our planet its characteristic azure hue. Until recently, people thought of the blue sky as a synonym for infinity. Modern science, however, has revealed that the Earth's atmosphere is a surprisingly thin cocoon. At 1,800 miles an hour, it's just a 10-minute ride to outer space. This is a view from the window of the space shuttle moments after launch. As it accelerates away from Earth, the craft begins to rotate, offering a unique panorama of the Florida coast. Once through the lower atmosphere, the hue of the sky deepens. Above the highest clouds, a succession of blue bands are etched against the darkening horizon. Above the boundary between the troposphere and stratosphere, the temperature is more than 100 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, and the air so rarefied that no terrestrial creatures can survive unaided. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis for the Miracle Planet. Here in the lush rainforest, it's hard to imagine how different conditions are a few miles above the treetops. This is a moderate world, where the surface temperature hovers in a narrow range, allowing water to exist in liquid form. The reason for Earth's unique climate is all around us, and yet easy to overlook, since it's nearly invisible. The air. Not only does it allow us to breathe, it protects the Earth from excessive solar heat and the most damaging forms of radiation. To understand how our planet maintains its temperate equilibrium, we must return to a time when the atmosphere was radically different, and so was the land. This is Arizona's Grand Canyon. A mile deep and between four and 18 miles wide, it is one of the natural wonders of the world. The Grand Canyon is so vast and deep, the vegetation changes from subtropical at the bottom to subarctic at the upper rim. The rugged canyon walls have been carved by erosion they reveal horizontal bands of sediment. 
These strata were deposited in different periods of the Earth's past. Each layer is one chapter in the long history of our planet's geologic evolution. Geologists have dated the rocks at the top of the canyon walls at roughly 200 million years old. While those at the bottom of the gorge are approximately 2 billion years old. Along the canyon wall, about halfway down, there is a rust-colored layer of rock. This red bed was laid down about 300 million years ago. Iron-rich sediments combined with increasing oxygen in the ocean to form layers of iron oxide. These layers indicate how far back in time free oxygen existed on the planet. The greatest episode of iron oxidation, two to three billion years ago, produced the enormous deposits of iron ore that are mined today all over the world. The rusty layers of iron oxide are a colorful example of the Earth's ongoing development. An intriguing aspect of this development is the source of the oxygen in these ancient deposits. Scientists believe that the oxygen was produced by primitive life. Three and a half billion years ago, bacteria-like creatures were already thriving in the oceans. Fossils indicate that these primitive creatures closely resembled the modern oxygen-producing organisms that formed these structures, called stromatolites. The ancestors of these stromatolites once colonized the oceans of the world. These primitive organisms continually release oxygen, which clings to their surface in tiny bubbles. Marine life gradually began taking more complex forms about 600 million years ago. Underwater plants began to develop in the shallow seas. Some evolved into various kinds of seaweed, heralds of the continental forests to come. The oceans were filling with oxygen-producing life, but on land, the scene was quite different. Prior to the emergence of land plants, the continents of the Earth were bleak. Life had been evolving in the sea for perhaps as long as three billion years, but the land remained almost devoid of life. There were no green fields, no forests, and no flowers to blanket the earth. On the red deserts, the sand shifted ceaselessly and the only voice was that of the wind. Why did it take life so long to establish itself on land? One answer lies in the evolving nature of the Earth's atmosphere and its effect on ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Ultraviolet radiation lies outside the spectrum visible to the human eye. We can't see it. Life could not survive on land without a shield from this intense light, which destroys genetic information necessary for cell reproduction. In the ocean, water absorbed the harmful ultraviolet radiation, 
but allowed the remaining sunlight to pass through for photosynthesis. Organisms like cyanobacteria could then grow and multiply, producing oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis. Eventually, the oceans could hold no more oxygen, and the excess gradually escaped into the air. When the oxygen reached the upper atmosphere, it was transformed into ozone. Like water, ozone has the ability to absorb ultraviolet radiation. Gradually, the layer grew thick enough to significantly reduce the amount of ultraviolet light reaching the Earth. Under this protective shield, higher forms of life could finally begin to colonize the land and live completely out of the water. Although the fossil record is incomplete, it appears that the first terrestrial creatures were bacteria. As levels of ultraviolet radiation continued to decrease on the surface of the planet, the first land plants emerged. By the Devonian period, about 360 million years ago, the main groups of higher plants had already appeared, including both spore and seed producers. It was into these low vegetative mats that the first land animals are believed to have crept. We don't know what animal was the first to set foot on land, but it was probably an amphibian. Amphibians, like frogs, are still found in shady protected areas on the wet margins of the land. Several species have a curious characteristic which may explain how early land creatures survived radiation levels higher than we know today. The eggs of the leopard frog are black on one side, white on the other. The white half contains important genetic material. It cannot block ultraviolet light, but the dark half can. This experiment is designed to test the effect of ultraviolet radiation on frog eggs. When the eggs are exposed to intense radiation, most eggs die. There are only a few scattered survivors. Is it possible that frog eggs use their dark protective cap as a shield against the deadly effects of ultraviolet light? These time-lapse pictures record the movement of normal frog eggs shortly after fertilization. In every case, the egg turns itself so that the dark side faces the light. The eggs instinctively rotate to block harmful radiation and transform it into heat, which aids incubation. Once it has turned its back to the sun, the fertilized frog egg divides into millions of cells. The intricate pattern of life begins to form itself again. development of a single cell into a tadpole 
and finally an adult frog. From the very beginning, it is all made possible by protection from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. 350 million years after amphibians first emerged from the oceans, ozone continues to shield the land, invisibly absorbing radiation. The ozone layer is only part of the protection provided by the Earth's atmosphere. The atmosphere also protects our planet from the full energy of the sun, which strikes heaviest along the equatorial belt. Why doesn't the sun bake the Earth to bare stone, as it has on Venus? Once again, the answer lies in the nature of the Earth's atmosphere. The air that blankets our temperate world dissipates the tremendous energy of the sun through the process of internal motion we call weather. It's dawn on Tarawa Island. Located in the Pacific Ocean at one degree north latitude, Tarawa is the most populous atoll of the nation of Kiribati. In tropical regions, the Earth's atmosphere receives intense energy from the sun. From these regions originate the air currents, which drive our planet's weather. The people of Tarawa have long enjoyed a bountiful world of warmth and light. Here, the climate is friendly, and the basic requirements of life are easy to obtain. Although many of the 33 islands in the group grow coconut palms and banana trees, the low atolls are generally not suitable for agriculture. The islanders of Tarawa depend on the sea, pursuing fish in their traditional sail-powered outriggers. Even on the sunniest days, the clouds put on a dramatic show around Tarawa. Time-lapse photography records the energy building within the clouds. As native navigators know, there are stronger winds and more clouds in the late afternoon. This is because the hot tropical sun evaporates large quantities of water from the surface of the Pacific in the tropical regions. When this warm, moist air rises, it cools, and the water vapor in it condenses to form clouds. These are classic cumulus clouds of the lower atmosphere. Born of the sun's energy, and carried higher and higher by that same heat, they provide elaborate displays in the afternoon. Often, the swirling clouds rise so high they are transformed into ominous thunderheads. These towering cumulonimbus clouds release tremendous amounts of energy into the Earth's atmosphere. Eventually, all of the water evaporated from the sea returns in the form of rain. The showers on Tarawa are as unpredictable as they are heavy. Yet they are never far removed from the sunshine that also falls on the blue ocean. As the clouds around Tarawa climb higher and higher, the rising air is replaced by wind rushing in from the northeast. Native children learn the ways of the wind with toy boats.
a constant breeze blows over Tarawa, and the islanders are masters of the wind as much as the water. The tropical regions are the birthplace of the winds, the zone on the globe to which the winds are continually, if not steadily, rushing. During the era of sail-powered vessels, navigators called these global air currents the trade winds. It was these winds that carried Magellan across the Pacific and Columbus across the Atlantic. The global nature of these trade winds is apparent in these images from space. Driven by the trade winds, clouds encircle the equator in these photographs compiled over five days in June. This is just one of the many weather systems that are constantly arising around the equator. In this infrared image, the red and yellow areas indicate warm water. The hot band entirely encircles the planet and powers air movement all over the Earth. Air warmed by the sun at the equator rises, produces clouds, and causes rain to fall. After releasing its moisture, the wind blows along the upper level of the troposphere until it comes down again. This circular movement of air is the most powerful of the Earth's wind systems, spawning not only the trade winds near the surface, but also the jet stream, which occurs seven miles above the Earth. The trade winds and the jet stream are two parts of an immensely complex, heat-driven weather system. Through them and all the other motions of the air, enormous amounts of energy are constantly being transferred from the hot band around the equator toward the polar regions, an estimated 4,000 trillion watts. In this way, Tropical heat is distributed to the whole world. Typhoons and hurricanes are the most violent forms of air motions. Their huge swirls indicate that the atmosphere is transporting heat out of the equatorial regions at a tremendous rate. Without air currents, the Earth would be much hotter at the equator and much colder at the poles than it is today. The movement of our planet's atmosphere is one of the main reasons the world is so temperate and hospitable to life. One of the most lush spots on the globe is the rainforest of Kalimantan, Indonesia. Located on the island of Borneo, the exceptionally dense forest is mostly composed of camphor, sandalwood, ironwood, and palm. Beneath their majestic spreading crowns lies an incredible array of life. The Earth's tropical rainforests contain perhaps 80% of the planet's vegetation and as many as four million different forms of life, including primates like the orangutan. In the tropical forest, the sun seldom penetrates directly to the ground. Everywhere, leaves and tendrils soak up the light and emit oxygen. Some large trees brace themselves above the ground with huge roots called buttresses. This enables them to spread their weight as widely as possible across the often mushy forest floor. Under the green canopy, the temperature is exceptionally constant, hovering around 86 degrees with humidity near 100%.
Of course, water is the key to the lush, temperate nature of the rainforest, and it comes to Kalimantan much the way it comes to Tarawa. In the afternoon, the brilliant tropical sun evaporates tremendous amounts of water from the forest below. As the air rises, it cools, and the moisture condenses into clouds, which release rain. Kalimantan receives between 100 and 200 inches of rain a year. About half this moisture originates as mist evaporated from the rainforest itself. The ecosystem here captures and retains enormous amounts of water. The process has created and continues to maintain one of the most lush environments on the face of the earth. Rainforests are the result of powerful air currents that circle the globe. But these weather patterns create arid deserts, just as surely as dense forests. Where the subtropical winds blow over land instead of water, the air becomes dry, creating deserts. These deserts are found on every continent between 20 and 30 degrees latitude, north and south of the equator. The largest is the broad Sahara, swept by desiccating winds. The most devastating wind in the South Sahara is called the Hermatan. The Hermatan originates not in the desert, but along the temperate Mediterranean coast of Africa. The desert wind begins over Algeria, in a region known for its mild climate. This area receives sun and rain in good measure. The land responds with abundant crops and rich grasslands for grazing. Especially in the winter, winds off the Mediterranean bring substantial rain to the Algerian hills. But the rain clouds do not penetrate far into the African interior. The Atlas Mountains block the way. For 1,500 miles, this natural barrier stretches from Morocco to Tunisia, reaching heights of 13,000 feet. Beyond these mountains, the Sahara Desert stretches for 3,000 miles. Day begins in the world's largest desert. Soon after dawn, the bitter night cold is burned off by the blinding sun. The Hormatan stirs to life. Like the winds of Tarawa, the Hormatan is part of the global trade wind pattern. But instead of blowing over thousands of miles of ocean, the Hormatan blows over land. The wind absorbs moisture from the land, which is not replenished. As a result, the Hermatan becomes a drying force rather than a bringer of rain. Crossing the Sahara from the northeast to the southwest, the wind sweeps huge quantities of sand and dust. It's not unusual for blinding dust storms to last for three to four days. The sky is choked with sand and dust, reducing visibility to 200 yards and less. The sand, which often seems to move like a river of the air, is sculpted into dunes, which can reach as high as 800 feet.
The actual shape of the dunes is largely determined by the direction of the wind and the supply of sand. But they all share one characteristic, the ability to move. Even when the wind stops, the dunes can stir and shift. Sand that has been blown into unstable shapes falls back under its own weight. There are long seaf dunes, named for the curved Arabian sword. And there are the curious looking Barkan dunes. These crescent shaped formations develop in areas where the supply of sand is limited and the direction of the wind is constant. The tips or horns of the Barkan become longer on one side if the wind direction varies significantly, but they always point downwind. Barkan dunes are frequently small, but larger Saharan dunes also respond to the wind. A satellite photograph of this broad desert region shows the powerful effect the wind can have in shaping the land. These sand rows, reaching from the northeast to the southwest, also indicate the direction of the prevailing wind. Here in the Western Sahara, the Hormatan is always blowing from the northeast to the southwest. A vast ocean of sand spreads out across the desert. Where does it all come from? One place is the Hogar Plateau. In this bone-dry land, years may pass between rainfall. These high mountains lie at the heart of the Sahara. The region was once covered with granite bedrock, and in some areas, limestone, laid down on an ancient seabed. Later, volcanic eruptions formed the mountains of the Hogar Plateau. They are ancient volcanic plugs of lava pushed up by violent forces below the surface. Columns of hard basalt are found in areas of volcanic activity throughout the world. But in the Sahara, even these rocky walls must face the inevitable forces that turn mountains into sand. In the cloudless desert, the sun beats down on the rocks heating some of them to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, because there is no insulating cloud cover, much of the surface heat escapes into space and the temperature falls rapidly to below freezing. Year after year, this extreme variation in temperature, close to 120 degrees, combines with the chemical weathering of the rock and helps break it down into smaller fragments. Sand blasting by the incessant desert winds continues day after day. The process of erosion goes on century after century until the mountains are finally reduced to grains of sand. Blown on the wind, the sand travels freely until it encounters an obstruction. Many dunes begin as small piles of sand behind a rock or bush. If the sand continues to drift, the individual dunes can grow to mountainous size. Thousands of separate dunes can also merge to cover huge areas, as in the North African sand seas, one of which is larger than France.
Here, the wind seems as endless as the sand that it is continually working into new variations of ancient patterns. Each dune, each ripple, is made up of individual grains of sand. Under a microscope, they often appear translucent and small enough to easily pass through the eye of a needle. Most of the desert sands are tiny grains of quartz. The red bits are particles of iron oxide. They lend a reddish appearance to the dunes and help color the dramatic desert sunsets. The iron oxide becomes a fine dust when separated from the quartz. While the heavier sand migrates close to the surface, the finer dust particles are swept high into the atmosphere, traveling far out into the Atlantic Ocean. This is a satellite image of a sandstorm above the Sahara. The sand and dust swept up in the heart of the desert are moving in a giant swirl toward the west, blown along by the northeast wind, the Harmattan. Downwind on the western edge of the Sahara, these recurring patterns of wind and sand are burying the nation of Mauritania. This well is almost 300 feet deep, so deep that it's difficult to draw water without help. Once, water was abundant here, but drought has forced heavy irrigation from the well. Now the water level has dropped so low, only the deepest wells yield life-giving water. These people have come from a village 10 miles away to draw water. They make the five hour round trip because the wells in their community have all gone dry. Near the well are a number of garden plots surrounded by palm trees. This cooperative farm has been funded by the government in an attempt to stabilize the lives of the nomads. Even in the Sahara, vegetables will grow if there is enough water. But the dwindling supply of water cannot hold back the force of the desert. The wind blows relentlessly, and sand continually invades the garden area. Date palm trees were planted to protect the farm from the surrounding desert. Today, they're losing the battle. Nomadic tribes once called this highway the Road of Hope. It was a main avenue of trade in the days when water was still plentiful. The nomads hoped to expand into the desert following this road. Now they trace the same route back into the towns, trying to escape the advancing desert. 
Driven away by the wind and sand, more and more people are abandoning their traditional homes and heading for a town downwind. The place in Mauritania where many refugees have fled is Nouakchott. The capital of a country the size of France and Spain combined, Nouakchott is known as the town of blowing wind. It has grown from 12,000 residents in 1964 to more than 350,000 today as the sand continues to advance on the outskirts of the city. Desert nomads join with millet farmers from the deteriorating agricultural land along the Senegal River. Together, they seek shelter in two sprawling shanty towns that have been called the largest refugee camp in the world. Some pitch tents, while others build shacks of cardboard and tin and scraps of wood. They struggle to survive on the edge of the advancing desert. Sand drifts in the streets of the capital as the Harmattan relentlessly blasts any exposed surface. These people abandon their villages to come here in search of water. Now they can go no further, for the Atlantic Ocean is at their backs. It is here that the Sahara meets the sea. Swept along on the Harmattan, the sands of the desert are carried far out into the Atlantic. As the dunes march on and on into the sea, they seem barely affected by their passage from one element into another. This is a satellite image of a Saharan sandstorm. Dust particles originating in the middle of the Sahara are blown by the wind toward the Atlantic coast of Africa and beyond out over the ocean. Every year, more than 250 million tons of sand and dust are carried out of the Sahara by the wind. This is nearly half the total amount blown off all the desert regions of the world. Dust particles are light enough to ascend into the upper atmosphere. Carried by high altitude winds, dust from the Sahara can reach Asia, Europe, and even the Americas. The movement of clouds gives a clue to the atmospheric link between the Sahara and the rest of the world. Over a three-month period, numerous cloud formations swirl over equatorial Africa. But in the subtropical regions north and south of the equator, few clouds are evident. It is in this northern dry belt that the Sahara Desert lies. Viewed from the North Pole, the pattern becomes even more striking by overlaying images of clouds generated over the same three-month period. Cloud formation is slight in a ring that encircles the globe from the Sahara across the dry Arabian Peninsula over to India and finally the desert regions of Mexico and Arizona. From the South Pole, we see a similar pattern. Here, the cloudless belt runs from the Kalahari Desert in Africa to Chile and on to arid Australia. Why are there almost no rain clouds in these regions? To understand the presence of global bands of clear sky and dry lands, 
we must return to the tropical regions and the water cycle that we saw at Kalimantan and Tarawa. The blowing winds of the Sahara Desert rob the earth of its moisture. As the wind from the north nears the equator, it converges with wind from the southern hemisphere. The intense heat of the tropical regions warms the air and causes it to rise. High in the atmosphere, the air cools, forms clouds, and causes rain to fall. This is why there is so much precipitation in the tropical region. North of the equator, after the air loses its moisture, it begins to move northward. It drops in altitude and gradually warms again. When the hot, dry winds blow across the land day after day, year after year, they create a desert. In this way, the winds gave birth to the Sahara, a desert equal in size to the entire continental United States. But the Sahara is only one of the desert regions parched by this planetary weather system. The rising and falling air masses are greatly influenced by the rotation of the Earth, causing them to flow around the globe. The air current encircles the Earth in the shape of a donut and creates a dry belt beneath it. It rises at the equator and then descends again around 30 degrees north latitude. A similar air current is in motion just to the south of the equator. Together, these air flows create two dry belts of arid land on either side of the lush tropical region. Rainforests and deserts, polar snow fields and fields of corn. All the world's diverse climates are regulated by the atmosphere and its weather. Life on Earth has long played an important role in shaping the atmosphere. Today, humans are the dominant life form on Earth. Our activities can help shape the atmosphere and upset the ancient equilibrium. We can see this happening in the equatorial rainforest, where 77,000 square miles of timber are being cut every year. This massive deforestation is causing basic changes in the weather of the tropical regions. Deforestation may even affect the climate of the whole world. Using computer models of the atmosphere, scientists can project what may happen if the deforestation of the world's equatorial rainforests continues at the present pace. The weather chart shows current conditions. Darker areas represent regions of higher rainfall. Notice that at present, the dark blue never disappears from the region of Africa's equatorial rainforests. But what would happen if all trees between 10 degrees north and 10 degrees south latitude were logged? A computer projection reveals the weather consequences of such a course of action. The image on the right represents current conditions, while the one on the left shows the effects of deforestation. After logging, rainfall would decrease in the tropics. By emphasizing the details, we can see the extent of the change. Annual rainfall would diminish to one-third its former level. The effects of the African deforestation would also be significant in distant Europe. Here, rainfall would decrease by nearly 20 inches a year. Even the climate of Scandinavia would be affected by cutting all of Africa's tropical forests. We can further gauge the impact by looking at potential changes in soil moisture. Computer images simulate the global effects of cutting Africa's tropical rainforests. The red areas indicate that there would be less moisture after deforestation. The green areas indicate more moisture. In Africa, it's not surprising to see a decrease in moisture content of the soil. Some regions would receive more moisture. But we can also see that the ominous red shadow of drought extends far beyond Africa into the Eurasian continent. Throughout the world, many regional weather patterns would change dramatically according to this projection.
One third of the world's equatorial rainforests are contained within the Amazon basin of South America. It is here, as well as Africa, that an intense assault is devastating the tropical rainforests today. Thousands of square miles of timber are logged in the Amazon every year. Commonly, the slash is collected and burned, leaving the earth naked to the elements. Under the tropical sun and rain, vital nutrients are easily leached from the impoverished soil. The land loses its ability to hold moisture and sustain life. At the same time, the climate becomes drier without the forest to hold moisture and return it to the air. The tropical forests are becoming smoldering wastelands, but humans are not the only cause of massive deforestation. In this tropical region of Southeast Asia, rainforests occasionally burn due to natural causes. In 1983, a forest fire in Borneo became the biggest conflagration of the century. The fire began on the eastern side of the island and then was fanned to immense size by the winds. It eventually consumed an area the size of Vermont and New Hampshire combined. Smoke from the blaze covered the entire southern half of Borneo. But unlike the ravages of slash and burn forest destruction, the natural disaster in Borneo has led to a rejuvenation of life. Just four years after the Borneo blaze, the forest had already begun to reclaim the land and heal the scars of the burn. It's hard to believe this is the same region that was reduced to smoking embers. New trees are already reaching 40 feet, and the climbing vines have ventured even higher up in the fire-killed trees. Four hundred million years after plants first began colonizing the land, life continues to take root on empty ground. Although they may suffer massive destruction, both the plants and animals of the tropical rainforest are capable of an impressive comeback. Life can recover from natural disasters like the Borneo fire. The rainforests have burned and been reborn. This continuing process maintains the global cycle of rainfall and drying winds. The deserts and the rainforests are linked together by the weather patterns that circle the globe but this intricate system may not withstand the effects of human civilization. Through systematic destruction of the tropical rainforests, we risk upsetting global weather patterns. Unless we understand the far-reaching implications of our actions, we stand to disrupt the delicate balance of our life-sustaining atmosphere. A temperate world of green and blue, or an arid wasteland. More and more, the choice will be ours to make.